Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. George Lazenby was the perfect James Bond. He had the looks, he could actually fight, and he really did love the girls. Why, after achieving such box office success, did he leave the famous role after only one movie? How did being James Bond affect the rest of his life? And the burning question, why did this never happen to the other fella? Why was George Lazenby such a different James Bond? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you're new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. George Lazenby, the star who walked away from fame and fortune. In 1939, in a small town called Goldburn, on the outskirts of Australia's capital city, just before World War II broke out, George Robert Lazenby was born to railway worker George Lazenby and his wife Sheila, who worked in the local department store. His younger sister Barbara was born in 1941 and became quite a successful dancer. George was educated at the local primary and secondary school and at the age of 14 his family moved to Queen Bean, closer to the capital, where his father ran a store. George left school at the same age and became a mechanic as well as a car salesman until at the age of 20 he joined the Australian Army. It was this time in the Army that he would play into George getting the role of James Bond later in life by giving him real fighting skills that he learned at quite a young age. He served as a sergeant in the Australian Army Special Forces and was unarmed combat and martial arts instructor during his enlistment. He holds black belts in Shotokan Ryu Karate and Judo. In 1963, George had done his time and when he returned to civilian life, became a ski instructor amongst other odd jobs, and he fell in love with a rich Australian girl called Belinda. He decided to move to London to pursue her. London was an expensive place to live and so he reverted first to his old profession as a car salesman and turned on the considerable charm that had him move from the car yards of Finchley to Park Lane quite quickly a testament to both his looks, confidence and charisma. It was at this time that a talent scout saw him and persuaded him to become a model, and within a year he was earning a cool £25,000 per year, which suited the lifestyle he certainly preferred. As a model, his career blossomed and he was soon a familiar face on advertising hoardings across Britain and Europe. He also starred in a lot of TV commercials around this time, Ironically, prior to becoming Bond, George's only filmmaking experience was a walk-on role in an Italian Bond spoof called Espionage in Tangiers. He is best known for his Big Fry chocolate advertisement and the European Marlboro Man, and from 1964 to 66 he was voted Top Male Model of the Year. George Lazenby was a rich and successful model with the world at his feet. Producer Albert R. Broccoli was getting his hair cut by a barber one day in 1966 when George walked in for a haircut as well. The two got chatting and when Broccoli saw George in the big fried chocolate advertisement a short time later, he became aware of how much the camera loved him and decided that he would get George into a screen test for the role of James Bond in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. George could see the potential of being asked to test for the role. Sean Connery was the first, only, and very iconic James Bond. George would have big shoes to fill. He wanted to prepare for the screen test as well as he could, so went to the same tailor as Connery and bought the most expensive Bond-type Savile Row suit available. He also wore the same Rolex Submariner that Bond wore in the movie and turned up at the Eon production studio unannounced and persuaded the producers Harry Saltzman and Albert R. Broccoli to give him an audition. With his considerable charm and good looks, enhanced by the fact that he was dressed just how you would expect a Bond to be, they decided to take a chance and audition him they did. George was up against some pretty handsome and experienced actors like Anthony Rogers, John Richardson and Robert Campbell for the part of Bond, but when you have a look at the audition tapes, George really stands out in the fight scenes. This Bond would be different, more brutal. During the auditions, George's previous experience in the special services and in martial arts became the reason he was so perfect for the part. 
because breaking the nose of one of the stuntmen, acting with him, was the lucky break that secured him the role of the second ever youngest, tallest James Bond, beating 400 other hopefuls. He was only 29. Later, when he had a meeting with director Peter Hunt, he confessed that he had lied to Saltzman and Broccoli and that he had never acted before in his life. Hunt thought this was the funniest thing he had heard and burst out laughing. He said to George, You say you can't act? You fooled two of the most ruthless men I've ever met in my life. Stick to your story and I'll make you the next James Bond. And so George took the gig for a paltry $50,000. Chicken feed compared to the five million dollars that Sean Connery took to come back for Diamonds Are Forever. George got the part and filming began, but as Peter Hunt, the director is quoted as saying, I'm not saying he's an actor. There's a great deal of difference between an actor and a film star. George's lack of acting experience turned out to be quite a hindrance on set. He hated the time spent endlessly waiting in full dress and makeup that kept him doing fun things. He was inevitably being compared to Sean Connery. He resented that all his suggestions were disregarded and as a leading actor surrounded by a stellar cast, he struggled with the strange juxtaposition of incredible fame and total inexperience. He was pretty full of himself as someone who had come out of nowhere and was chosen for an iconic role might be, and the other cast and crew members resented his attitude. George parted hard, drank a lot, rode his motorcycles at dangerous speeds and chased the girls. Somewhat similar to how his character behaved, but the difference was that James Bond had a scriptwriter and George Lazenby had no real idea how to play his part on and off the screen. He was completely out of his depth. George had the looks and the staticness of Bond, but just couldn't get along with other cast and crew members. His co-star and screen wife, Diana Rigg, wrote an open letter to the press about George's onset behaviour, calling it paranoid, and that he was subjected to inexcusable and crude behaviour. She went on to say, by the end of the film, most of the crew were hostile, but only because of your extreme behaviour. Why else would your dresser threaten to hand in his notice? Why else would three chauffeurs leave you within a week? Why else was one member of the unit restrained from striking you after one inexcusable and crude outburst against one of the girls in the film. Desmond Llewellyn, who played Q in 17 Bond films, was quoted as saying, How can you expect someone who has never acted before to take on a leading role? Which was really the crux of the matter. George's complete inexperience, lack of understanding of the requirements of the film industry, and unwillingness to do an apprenticeship led to all the problems on set. The tabloids had a field day, with the dramas caused by George's inability to understand what level of discipline is really needed to create a movie at this level, and there are many accounts of fights, drinking, disputes, and generally unwarranted behaviour on the sets. Some of it is exaggerated, most of it is not. Towards the end of the filming, Ronan O'Reilly, George's agent, started to talk to George about how Bond was becoming outdated and in the liberated 1960s about to become unfashionable. He thought that continuing with Bond would be the end of George's career. George's own belief about making love, not war, also fed into the advice he was receiving from his agent. George felt that Bond had no further credibility or relevance, and he became more interested in making movies like Easy Rider, which starred Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda fighting against the establishment. He felt the Bond franchise was out of touch with the vibe of the day, and began to believe that continuing with the Bond franchise would kill his career. Every time the studio sent over a contract for the next eight Bond films, O'Reilly sent them back unsigned. A month before the movie was released, it was announced that George had quit. He said the role was outdated and claimed he was treated badly by the producers. He had flown back to Australia to see his parents to discuss it, and is later quoted as saying, My parents think I'm insane. Everyone thinks I'm insane. But he still walked away from an eight-movie contract. George truly thought his time had arrived and assumed he would pick up plenty of work post-Bond, especially when it turned out to be a box office success. He had imagined getting roles like Clint Eastwood in Rawhide and playing characters that had more in common with his own beliefs. He grew a beard, moustache and long hair and said, Bond is a brute, I shall never play him again. 
On Her Majesty's Secret Service came out in December 1969, and by 1970 George literally had no work. Eon Studios had nothing nice to say about him, and nobody would touch him after the Bond set fiascos. The word was out. He was difficult. George managed a few parts, like the mercenary and Universal Soldier and the father of the murdered daughter in Who Saw Her Die, a 1972 Italian movie, and then spent 15 months sailing the world with his then-wife, Chrissy Townsend. It was on this trip that Chrissy got pregnant, and they decided to settle down, marry, and raise a family. They had two children, Zachary and Melanie. George decided to have another go at acting. By February 1973, George had spent all the money he made on the Bond film, had had a couple of nervous breakdowns, and was an alcoholic. He admitted, I burnt some bridges behind me, and it was fun, really. I'm sort of glad I did it, and I know I won't have to do it again. I can look back and laugh because I didn't hurt anyone, except myself. George got a minor part in a British TV series called Play for Today, and was meant to shoot a western in Turkey and a film about rioting students in Cuba, but neither film went into production. At this point he moved to Hong Kong where he met Bruce Lee and Raymond Chow and was offered a part in a movie they were producing called Game of Death. All parties were excited about the project, but Bruce Lee's totally unexpected death put an end to its production. He did shoot three other films for the Golden Harvest Production Company, which were quite popular in Asia, but not so much in the Western world. George then tried to break into Australian movies and got a few roles, but nothing spectacular. He was willing to work, but the roles just weren't there for him. Still trying to reactivate his career in the late 1970s, he moved to the United States and got a role in the TV movie Cover Girls. With still no real offers coming in, George took out an ad in Variety offering himself for acting work. He was quoted as saying at the time that Bond got him into acting work but wasn't worth the ten years that it cost me afterwards. From this point on, George was only offered bit parts, mainly in TV shows, and his movie acting career never took off with him in the star's position again. He moved into business investments in the 1980s and got into buying and selling real estate, becoming a real estate agent for a while as well. His son Zachary was diagnosed with brain cancer at the age of 11 and died at the age of 19. His marriage to Chrissy did not survive this tragedy and they divorced and he took a break from the public scene. In 2002 he married tennis star Pam Shriver and they welcomed twins Caitlin and Elizabeth and then Samuel into the family but this relationship too was short-lived and they divorced in 2008. These days, George's public appearances are for the die-hard fans at Comic Cons, anniversaries of the film's premiere, and autograph signing. He lives in Brentwood, Los Angeles, in California, and is sometimes referenced as a disparaging way of describing a non-iconic acting role. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. George Lazenby characterised a different kind of James Bond. But be honest, who do you identify James Bond with? Which actor? Of course it's Sean Connery. But then why did he say never again to James Bond roles?